Hi everyone, over to you John. All right, thank you very much. Welcome back everyone. And welcome to building a design system to scale, why the dam is instrumental with Stanley Security featuring Julian Murphy. As a matter of housekeeping, don't forget to type your questions in the Q&A box at any point throughout the session. And we'll have about 10 minutes at the end to answer all your questions. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to my esteemed colleague, Julian Murphy. Take it away, Julian. Thank you, John. And uh, may I say thank you to Henry Stewart Events for inviting me here today to speak to you all about Stanley Security's digital asset management journey. So a little bit about me. My name is Julian Murphy. I'm the Global UX Director for Stanley Security based in the Bay Area, California. Uh, as you may be able to guess from my accent and the wonderful red dragon flag there, I'm originally from Wales in the UK. And over to the right, I've included a little sampling of the things that I love, including my obsession with sci-fi, hashtag this is the way, Californian beaches, Welsh castles, attempting to hug giant ancient California redwoods, and last but by no means least, my rescue fur babies who I have locked out of the room this morning, otherwise they'd be all over this feed right now. So a little bit about Stanley Security. For those of you who may not know, Stanley Security is a subsidiary of the Stanley Black & Decker Corporation, famous for such brands as Craftsman, DeWalt, Irwin Tools, and many more besides the eponymous brands in its name. Stanley Security is made up of a number of sub-brands itself, many of which you can see on the slide here. And many of those brands themselves are made up of sub-brands, such as healthcare, which includes a number of market leading brands, including probably the most famous, the Hugs Infant Protection System and its partner product, Kisses. So you can imagine that the biggest challenge we had with having so many brands and so many assets is that we needed to find a way to scale global adoption of a system that would ultimately house a plethora of creative assets from these multiple brands. We had to build for scale and we had to abandon the ineffective practice of, of siloing creative assets across multiple applications such as Dropbox, SharePoint, Box, and many more in between. In short, we needed a single source of creative truth for our brand to support the Aditi design system. So what was our objective? So essentially usability was our number one priority and thus the phrase a dam is only as useful as it is usable was born. Through our user research, we broke down or identified four key areas of improvement. Users needed to be able to find what they needed when they needed it in a humanized fashion. The system needed to be able to handle real-time updates to metadata, to asset changes, to settings, taxonomy, etc. The system needed to be accessible across an agnostic platform base. So whether it's desktop, mobile, it needed to be accessible through those. And then lastly, the system had to scale with us. So whether that scale came from organic growth or through M&A activity, the system needed that flexibility to grow with us. So where do we start? So to quote a mentor of mine, former chief design officer at Apple, Sir Johnny Ive, he says that to create something truly new, you have to start again. So where do we start? Where do we start? How do we create something new? Where do we start? Well, we have to start by learning from our past mistakes and we learn from our prior dam implementation. And when we went through our UX research, we identified the four key areas that I touched upon in the prior slide. Users were commenting that they were frustrated. They couldn't find what they needed. They were tired of having to wait 24 hours to updates to appear in the system. And after those 24 hours, it wasn't guaranteed that the action that they wished to perform was going to be successful. They may have to wait 24 hours for an error message to then try again. They complained of poor performance and they complained of no cloud access. So they were forced to use in their desktop. So we in the project team had this false consensus that we had built a system that the, that the users loved and they had everything that they needed 
to be able to find. They had this wonderful taxonomy and everything was there, but it failed to deliver on that key notion of usability and our users eventually abandoned the system. So with usability as our key objective, we knew that we had to redefine the taxonomy. We had to abandon that typical hierarchical waterfall approach for a more matrix style approach. We had to meet the user where they were and allow them to find the asset that they needed when they needed it, no matter the angle they came from. So if they wish to search in this instance for a Stanley van, then they should be able to find the asset that they're looking for. If they wish to use an Amazon type experience and go through the taxonomy that way through brand or industry or asset type, they should have that capability. And our current taxonomy didn't support that. So with our taxonomy redefined, the next stage was to curate the content. This was an activity that was even more pressing given the onset of the pandemic where customer sites where we would take photos of the, the, the uh, photos in all the products in use, they were actually starting to be locked down and we had our own internal policies that would prevent people from traveling. So it was very difficult to get those shoots. So working with 11 different content teams across 10 different brands, we were able to curate all our content. But the main thing that happened is we actually discovered we had assets we didn't even know about. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank our Scandinavian team who were instrumental in finding and introducing us to some amazing, beautiful environment shots that you might have seen further up in this masonry grid. So my hat's off to them. Thank you so much for allowing us to share those with the rest of the organization. And then the other part of curating was we introduced an organizational first process of associating legal release forms with applicable assets. So not only were we able to curate the, the assets themselves, but also the legal release forms that went along with that. Now I will touch on this a little bit, late, a little bit later, but know that this process was hitherto very labor intensive, if at all possible. So with our taxonomy redefined and with our content curated and classified, the next step was to build and configure the system to provide a seamless and enjoyable experience to our users, fixing the issues of the past. So as we look at the live system here, we have uh, instantly heavily branded experience as the user goes to log in. Clearly you've got the favicon, you've got the logo, but then you have this beautiful collage that we I reused on the homepage here uh, that, that reinforces the strong branding. As the user goes to log in, they're presented with the homepage, nothing new there. But one of the things that we did here was you can see that the principal usability issue has been addressed. We refined the UI to ensure that search was front and center and therefore it mimics that Google experience, reinforcing familiarity for our users. In addition to that, we also increased the size of the search bar three times to help reinforce the visual contrast on the page and also the visual hierarchy. As I mentioned earlier, through user research, we were able to identify that our user cohorts frequently searched for and downloaded similar assets. So using that information along with session analysis, we were able to curate those assets into applicable collections and make them available for single click access on the homepage. One of the most requested and most popular collections were people images. So if I drill into one of those right now, instantly you're presented with a a vast amount of uh, people images that could include Stanley employees and or customers. And it's pretty straightforward. You can click in and you can see the, the, the asset here. And this is Ashley, one of the uh, Stanley and security employees. But I touched on earlier the process that we introduced of attaching legal media release forms to the assets themselves. And at Stanley security, whenever an identifiable human is present in a photo, like you're seeing Ashley here, we require legal media release forms. And this will prove in an instant that Stanley Security has full legal rights to that particular asset. Typically in the past, what happened is if we couldn't produce that, then that image would have to be removed from either our dam or any digital or physical property that it might be used across. 
So in this situation, a process that was very labor intensive in the past and would take weeks or months, if at all possible, is now resolved in a matter of seconds where the user can just click in and instantly prove in the event of an audit that they have full rights to that image. And moreover, through the magic of referential linking, we can now see that all of these images are tied to that release form. So if you think about going back to the taxonomy and giving the user the power, if they searched for the release form first, they could then see all the photos tied to that release form. Again, this was an introduction of a process that was very labor intensive in the past, if at all possible, because these physical documents were in filing cabinets or in bags or wherever else they may have been. So with the system built and configured, we entered the most exciting phase of the project, in my opinion, which was the launch phase. So inspired by Lewin's change management model of freeze, refreeze, or refreeze, freeze rather, we created a landing page to extol the benefits of the new system, but without disparaging those of the prior one. And as Simon Sinek would recommend, we focused on the why by drilling home how this new system resolved or satiated the requirements and challenges of the prior system, namely searching and sharing. And then we kind of played into the, the fear of missing out mentality by including a CTA for early adopters to get immediate access to the system. In addition to the landing page, we ran a series of drop-in webinars during the launch week, which included many introductory topics. It highlighted some of the features and benefits of the system and what to expect in the coming days and weeks. Uh, we also in built a series of short form onboarding videos that covered a number of topics, some of which that you see here on the slide, made these available for our users. And then last but by no means least, we created a whole series of self-help cliff note style documentation and made these available not only in the app itself but on our community so how successful were we well we know that everybody loves stats in a presentation so to satiate curiosity i threw together some kpis here that cover the first six months of the new system now, we aren't blessed with a large user into a database like our cousins in DeWalt and Craftsman and so forth, but we do have some remarkable stats over that first six months. The key takeaway here is that over the first six months, we had more engagement than the, over the entire 18-month lifespan of the prior system, which is pretty cool. But the one that stands out for me in these stats right here was the searches and shares it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. And it proved that not only were users interacting with the searches, but the assets that they then found, they were using the system as intended and sharing them through collections like we had done on the homepage. So the practice of downloading the image, putting it in an Outlook message, and then sending it off to an external or internal colleague was finished. People were actually using the system as intended, which was great vindication for us as a team. So what does the future look like for digital asset management at Stanley Security? One of the areas I alluded to earlier that we're especially proud of is our internal community. Stanley uses the workplace platform from Meta. Think of it like Facebook for work. And we created a community there where we share best practices, hints, tips, webinars, updates, and so much more in between. We've seen some fantastic organic growth here and will continue to be a very active partner in this self-sustaining community. We're also, we've also started to empower our non-designers with the tools that they need to create engaging and more importantly, on-brand social graphics. We are seeing a lot of designers, a lot of non-designers, sorry, taking advantage of these templates and creating very engaging graphics. So we'll continue to democratize our design efforts moving forward and looking for more ways to enhance the options for our non-design users. And by non-design, I mean those that may not have access to the strong design platforms like Figma or Photoshop or Illustrator or, or anything in between. We'll also look to integrate our digital asset management system 
further into our existing digital properties through dynamic asset transformation. So in the future, our, in the near future, our digital platforms will not only be able to serve up assets directly from the dam, but they'll be able to dynamically render that asset in the most optimized version in terms of size and focal point based on the breakpoint or device the user may be using. This will allow us to unlock greater performance benefits and finally unlock truly centralized asset management. And as true UX professionals, we will continue to improve through continuous insights garnered from user research. To quote Frank Camero, I love this quote, people ignore design that ignores people. So we recently completed our first of hopefully many usability studies of the platform. And our intention here was to uncover frustrations, challenges that users were having with the new system. So we have the, oops, I went too far ahead, I'm sorry. So the result of that was that we were meeting the user where they were and we were resolving the challenges that they had even with our optimized or new workflows, I should say. So if we look at one example here, and I did cover this a little bit prior in the presentation and some of the screenshots I used are of the new iteration and what we learned from the platform. What you're seeing here is the old version of the logging, uh, sorry, of the home screen. So through our user interviews, we uncovered that users were a little bit confused with the header. They found it a little bit distracting. And also some of the asset collections that we put on the homepage were a little bit misleading and or not beneficial to them. So using that information, using the session analysis, we simplified the header. And so it's the same across the board now for all users. And as I mentioned earlier, we curated the most popular assets and made them available for easy one-click access on the, on the homepage. So this is just one example of continuous improvement through user research and session analysis. We'll of course continue to strive for continuous improvement by using the insights garnered from speaking to our users. At Stanley Security, we, can, we are committed to putting our users at the center of product design because in my eyes, at the end of the day, if you're not doing the user research, then you're building a product for yourself. You're not building it for your users. And that's it. That's a, a small window into our digital asset management journey at Stanley Security. Clearly, there's a lot more left for us to do. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing where, where myself and the team take the system in the future. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. You uh, you made a whole lot of new damn friends uh, with your opening <laughs> slide. Uh, a lot of good feedback. A lot of good feedback. Uh, where do I begin? Uh, the, so everyone, uh, all the good chat that you've had, convert those into questions and put on the question side now. But uh, two things I wanted to mention. I love that quote you um, referenced by Frank uh, Camaro. I believe uh, the pronunciation might be, people ignore our design that ignore people. My goodness, can we just not like, just get that on a t-shirt and just remind <laughs> ourselves of that every day. And especially with DAM, uh, DAM and UX and user research that we don't talk enough about this. Uh, and so well done, bravo for, uh, for stewarding us here today on that topic. Um, so let's get to some questions. We do have uh, a little bit of time here for some questions. A few I'd like to begin with is um, what, Let's see if I read this correctly. How was the larger organization trained in how to use templates? Many of our uh, many of the attendees today are probably using templates in the organization. Good question. So, uh, how was the how was the larger organization trained in how to use templates? Good question. So that, that's a, it is a great question. And um, essentially, the the way the templates are constructed is there. There's definitely a fine line between um, customization and, and, and usability. So what we did was when we thought about the templates, we kind of created a sandbox with those templates. So the user had demarcated areas that they could change. So we were kind of putting the guardrails up or the 10 pin bowling bumpers that I used to use as a kid, but uh, those we were putting up those guardrails so that it was very hard for them to go wrong. 
Um, I mean, of course they could, they could make mistakes, but we were trying to building as much um, flexibility and control as, as possible. They still, so if we have an area for an image, so if we look at my screen right here, we would allow them to edit this particular text, for instance, and the image in the middle, they would be able to swap that out, but it would always be constrained to that circle, for instance. And as you said in one of your earlier slides, this is all about listening and improving. Uh, again, I think that's a thematic thing that we should all be able to take away uh, from your presentation today. Um, one question has just come in from Deanna. Do you, do you use more than one language for your metadata? Mm, great question. We um, Great question. We do, that is a great question. And that's actually been one of our challenges uh, because as I mentioned, our Scandinavian team in the Scandinavian countries, especially in Dutch, we have long, longer words. So whilst we did include translation, we, and I, this was something I did personally, I went through the entire system and translated in all the, the languages, but it was, <clears throat> we are using different languages, um, but we've just started on that journey and it's, it's definitely been a challenge for us. Um, it's primarily English right now, but we definitely um, are building on working with the French and the Dutch teams, especially that have those longer character uh, words. And do you have someone dedicated on the team that manages the metadata or is that sort of a shared responsibility? We kind of have, uh, let me count, it's four people that actually kind of share that at the moment, myself and, and three other admins, yeah. And then we have regional teams uh, regional brand manager teams then around the different regions who will help us not only translate, but manage the metadata specific to those areas. Excellent. Well done. Uh, another question has come in from Anonymous. Well done, Anonymous. Uh, how, <laughs> how were collections curated uh, to be displayed on the homepage? That was many of us have Many of us have those curated collection type questions. So that's a good one. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, it really came, it's twofold. It was a lot of the speaking to the users, um, a lot of surveying, a lot of user interviews, uh, working with different regions, because some regions actually, I, th I think in the Scandinavian regions, don't quote me team, um, but I believe there was a, a cultural difference where people smiling at a camera was not necessarily culturally appropriate for that region. So people images for that region would have were, were different so it was about speaking to experts on the ground speaking to our users speaking to our teams and then also adding to that session analysis so seeing dynamically what were the most popular assets what are people going after one of the most popular assets the stanley logo so making sure stanley logos are there at the front so we, it was a mix between speaking to the users and session analysis nice uh another question has come in uh, what was your approach to creating the video onboarding? I've seen many other people do video onboarding projects with their organizations. So I think that's a really good question. How did you do that? So the, the videos was an idea I had by watching a lot of, in the design world, obviously you get a lot of influences online that, that, that take you through you know, a multitude of different platforms and so forth. And we found that people weren't engaging necessarily with, we can create a fancy screenshot and upload it to the community, but people weren't necessarily looking at it. So we actually found that doing a very short form video was way more impactful and people would engage with that a lot more. So our goal was to create an under one minute video. It was sometimes even just 30 seconds, but a very, very short form video and then start releasing those on the community. And in terms of the topics that we picked, we basically would were judging the topics based on the frustrations people were having before, um, namely searching. That was the most important thing. The, the number one objective was people needed to find what they needed. And obviously this is an ongoing exercise in terms of listening and improving to what you're hearing from your, from your internal team. Exactly, exactly. It, it changes a lot. Um, and the one thing I would encourage again is, is just like you mentioned, John, the listening to your users and continuing to, there's a difference between user feedback and insights. I mean, if you listen to the feedback, then you could go off the wrong path, for instance, but it's the insights you gather from that collective feedback is the important piece is acting on those insights that you can extrapolate. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, DAM is, is a program, it's ongoing. It's not just one, and you know, it's not a project, it doesn't end. It keeps on going. So the encouragement for those on the webinar today to realize that they do need to listen and improve and always talk to the users uh, is a very fundamental part of, of doing good digital asset management. Uh, another question has come in. Um, what, what are the types of topics or events that are being discussed in those community workplaces that you've created? Good mm. question. So a lot of the one thing that there's there's a multitude of topics. Um, new asset new asset delivery is a is a really popular one. Uh, and what I like about this is I personally built the community and then seeded it in the, in the beginning. But the greatest vindication came from when community members started offering their own content, and it was really nice to see people don't take this wrong way, but bragging about the assets that they uploaded and. Again, props to the to the Scandinavian team that they were proud to share these wonderful images, and and it opened up the entire organization's eyes to these new assets. Um, but in addition to that, we've also we demystify some of the areas of the app. So, for instance, user user accounts or user roles. You know, we talk about that. If people have errors, if people are looking to sign up external colleagues, um, what's the best way for sharing with externals? What if we have a photographer offsite? And we need to upload photos for review. How do we do that? So it's a lot of Q and A, um, webinars, product updates. I even do, uh, or the team even does, um, a quarterly statistic share. So we show the most popular assets. Um, and by the way, whenever you do that, you see this spike right after when you share those uh, most popular assets because people go there to go re-download them just in case because we have to. They're popular. <laughs> What great evidence of the fact that, you know, people do listen and when they do want to communicate and share, it actually does work. I love that example. Very good. Uh, yeah. Another question from Anonymous has come in. Um, hope this makes sense. How do you retire content? How do you mm. retire content? That's a great question. The It's actually twofold. Um, so we never actually delete content. Uh, we actually mark it as archive, but in layman's terms, it, we essentially leave it in the dam, but we hide it from all users except uh, except the, the 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 administrators and the brand managers. And the best in the, the best example of why we do that, I actually use an anecdote from our cousins in Dewalt or Craftsman, is that if you think about if you have a bunch of tools, those tools are they get replaced by newer tools. Those tools are then they're no longer sold in the stores. Uh, so those assets are then marked as archive and hidden, but there may come a time where you have surplus inventory that you may want to sell. So those assets may be required at a later stage, then we can unarchive them or the administrators can make them available as limited usage for the, the, the users that need them. So we never delete, uh, we, we simply, um, unless it's an erroneous uh, asset, we simply mark it as archive and hide it from view. Mm -hmm. Never delete, probably a good, uh... <laughs> Quote for everyone. Yeah. Uh, last question: uh, Governance uh, and UX. Do you, is there any governance in the type of work that you're doing there, Julie? I think that, that, that's a that's a that's a very good question. The I wish my partner in crime Quinn was here. He would uh, he he was he's very good at that. Um, we it's kind of shared across the team. We don't do we obviously have an approval. Pro well, I shouldn't say obviously. We have different user levels uh, and we empower those different levels uh, with a, an, an element of autonomy. So our brand managers and contributors, they can upload into the system. We trust those users. They are our power users. We trust them with the assets they upload. So there is no governance around those. They are intimately ingrained with our thought practices and what's required from a legal and creative level. Uh, but for the other users, and that sounds really bad, but the contributors are people that we, I've really dug myself a hole here, who we don't necessarily trust with full permissions to upload assets. Um, they upload and then there is a full uh, governance process where we go through, review those images and, or, or videos and, and adjust and, and work with them accordingly. That's good governance. I like that, Julian. Very well done. The uh, I think the theme uh, for all those attending today is, are you listening and are you improving? And um, if everyone can give a virtual applause uh, and join me in thanking <laughs> Julian 
excellent presentation. Uh, you've inspired uh, many people. The feedback is quite exceptional here. Uh, people ignore design that ignore people. Are we listening and are we improving? Thank you very much, Julian. And um, yeah. uh, now there's time to grab another cup of coffee and join the Birds of a Feather Lounge discussion. So take a seat at a virtual table in the lounge to chat with fellow attendees. Tables are first come, first served, so go now. Uh, uh, or visit the exhibition to see how sponsors can help you with your dam. And Julian, thank you very much again. Excellent, excellent work. Thank, thank you. you, thank you.